What's up party people and welcome back to another episode of NYC Foodways, your weekly food and culture discussion from the cultural capital of the world. My name is John and this week's episode is dedicated to master wordsmith Alan Moore, who's got enough styles to start three fads. This week on NYC Foodways, we conclude our series on Joseph Mitchell with an analysis of Joe Gould's secret, initially published as a book, unlike the rest of what we've reviewed, by Viking Press in 1965. Whose story are we telling when we tell the story of another? During his decades at The New Yorker, Joseph Mitchell perfected the long-form character study known as The Profile. In 1942, The New Yorker published his article titled Professor Seagull, a profile on one Joe Gould, who claimed he had been working on the lengthiest unpublished work in existence, but in fact had only written and rewritten scraps of autobiographical text amounting to no more than a total of perhaps 50,000 words. The publication of Professor Seagull brought Joe Gould no small measure of fame, and his life as a professional, alcoholic, dirtbag mooch became much easier. One of the most tired cliches about New York City is its purported transmogrifying nature, but in Joe Gould's case, it might actually have been true. Well, true via a tower of lies. Gould arrived in New York very much one thing and became, through sheer force of will, immense consumption of alcohol, the spotlight of Joseph Mitchell's pen, and several tons of outright lies, very much something else. Gould duped countless people, no doubt, but he had himself fooled worse. The mental gymnastics needed to concoct, arrange, and deploy lies of such frequency, magnitude, and duration would break a normal man, but Gould was so deep in his own soup of falsity, he somehow managed to do so. As mentioned before on this channel, speaking about oneself is a storied New York pastime, and Gould's claim that his oral history would cement him as a historian in the same league as Gibbon has got to be one of the greatest disproportionately false feats of self-aggrandizing this fair city has ever known. In late 1943, Mitchell discovered, accidentally, from a remark from his unconscious, as he puts it, that the lengthiest unpublished work in existence remained unpublished for no other reason that it simply didn't exist in the first place. Instead of immediately revealing Joe Gould as a fraud, and himself as accessory to fraud in a way. Mitchell kept Joe Gould's secret a secret until the publication of Joe Gould's secret over 20 years later. At the denouement of Joe Gould's secret, Mitchell chooses not to expose Gould for what he is. This was probably cowardly, Mitchell admits, and I wholeheartedly agree. Accommodating the weaknesses and lies of others does nothing but make them weaker and more frequent liars. Mitchell knew there was no oral history, and Gould knew Mitchell knew, but Mitchell declined to, in his words, blow the whistle on him, tear up his meal ticket, so to speak. Why? Mitchell uncharacteristically makes a number of half attempts to explain himself, that he was relieved that the world wouldn't have to suffer another unnecessary book, I find this hilarious, that he actually respected Gould for constructing such a durable mask for himself, that there was no law that said that Mitchell had to pin Gould down, that it was better to leave things the way they were, up in the air. I believe the real reason to be something else entirely. Whose story are we telling when we tell the story of another? Mitchell writes that following Gould's death, he had replaced the real Joe Gould, or at least the Joe Gould he had known, with a cleaned up Joe Gould, an after death Joe Gould. Mitchell follows this by stating that by forgetting the discreditable or by slowly transforming the discreditable into the creditable, as one tends to do in thinking about the dead, Mitchell had, so to speak, 
respectabilized him. I, this is John speaking now, think this is a pretty common occurrence and likely one humans developed as an evolutionary coping mechanism. In refinishing his memories of Gould, Mitchell wasn't only respectabilizing Gould, he was respectabilizing his own life's intersection with Gould, Gould's secret, and his decision to keep it quiet for so long. Elsewhere in Joe Gould's secret, Mitchell, ruminating on his involvement with Gould and the frequent visits Gould made to talk at him at length, wrote that, by knowing so much about his past, I had, in effect, become a part of his past. By talking to me, he could bring back his past, he could keep it alive. Couldn't the same be said in reverse? Without Gould, how much of Mitchell's past would disappear? The title of this book, after all, isn't Joseph Mitchell's secret, although it could be. And really, this might help define the actual reason Mitchell kept the lid on things for so many years. Because when we involve in ourselves in the lives of others, our threads of existence and memory blend and weave together, and we carry the burdens and joys of others just as they carry our own. As these threads are worn down with age, some of them become warped, and we select which parts of our shared memories to preserve, the parts that likely support our own fragile narrative for good or for ill. Mitchell's decision to keep quiet not only sealed Gould's fate as a bona fide local celebrity, but his own as well. Though he continued to publish widely, much of the text in the series is drawn from writings made following his discovery of Joe Gould's secret. Mitchell's role of confidant, and in some ways, co-liar, clearly weighed heavily on him and, following the publication of the book Joe Gould's Secret, he never produced another piece of writing of any appreciable length. This bears repeating. One of the finest writers of creative nonfiction, possibly the finest, this country has ever produced was either unwilling or unable to keep writing after Joe Gould's secret and his own were brought to light. For decades, Mitchell continued to show up to his office, yes, but nothing productive came of his time. It is impossible to say exactly what blocked Mitchell, but one does not need a formal education in human psychology to perceive a link between the case of Joe Gould and the case of Joseph Mitchell. Whose story am I telling when I tell Mitchell's? Whose story is Mitchell telling when he tells Gould's? Whose story is Gould telling when he tells his own? Who are we lying to when we know the truth, but are, for whatever reason, unable to bring it to light? What are the analgesic lies we tell ourselves daily to cover up the painful truths that would actually help us grow? We're gonna end this series on Joseph Mitchell, not with a quote from Mitchell, but rather one from Gould. And here it is. I would judge the sanest man to be him who most firmly realizes the tragic isolation of humanity and pursues his essential purposes calmly. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week for another episode of NYC Foodways. Peace.